Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my round five recap of Tata Steel Chess. Now, this round was one with some very interesting games, not just in the Masters tournament, which saw some new leaders rise to the fore, but also in the Challengers tournament, where we saw a new player take a one point lead in the event. So make sure to watch the full video to enjoy that. And by the way, if you are enjoying this video, make sure to smash that like button and definitely consider subscribing as it's the easiest way for you to improve your chess. With that being said, let's get into our first game. I'm going to skip past the game between Geary again to fit it. It was a Petrov defense. Pretty boring to be quite frank and yeah, it ended up being a draw in 33 moves from around this point. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it or really any time on it. But it's to say that Vidit was able to keep his lead with this draw, but then he was joined in the lead by a couple of others. But those others did not include either of the players in our next game between Niels Grandelius against Magnus Carlsen. And actually, I'm going to show this game from Grandelius' perspective, because he actually was winning against Carlsen at one stage in this game. But let's see what happened. It was e4, c5, and a little bit surprisingly, Carlsen decided to play the Taimanov, which I think is not one of his normal systems. But I remember Grandelius was one of Carlson's seconds in, I believe, the 2018 World Championship match for against Caruana, where he prepared the Sveshnikov, so probably just why he decided to do something a little bit different in this game. Also, keep in mind at this point, Grandelius was only on half a point out of four, so obviously Carlson was smelling blood, but so was Niels. And after A6, he went for not the old mainliner Queen D2 or the modern mainliner Queen F3, but he went for the move g4, following in a very similar spirit to his game against Richard Rapport from a round or two earlier, where he went for g4 on move 6. In fact, if Black plays move h6, it actually transfers back to the Grand Elias Rapport game. But instead, Carlsen goes for a different approach. And he plays the move knight takes d4, and just goes for this very standard development b5, bishop b7, just developing the queen side. And let's see how it played out. Castles, bishop b7 f3, and now we're actually in a position that's very much like the, uh, like the normal English attack. But the difference is in a normal English attack, you'd have moves like, let's say, knight f6 and, uh, sort of included, like knight f6, king b1 included. Whereas here, the difference is knight f6 just runs into g5, and it's just a much worse version, right? Where wise being able to play queen takes d4 in one go. Whereas if you compare it with the old main line, queen f2, d2, knight f6, and this old main line like b5, you can see the difference quite clearly that, you know, black has spent an extra, white spent extra tempo playing queen d2 takes f4 as opposed to queen d1 takes f4. And so it means that extra tempo bishop e7 does allow black to maintain the balance. And this was sort of the main line theory about 10 years ago, but then people realized queen d2 is not really giving white an advantage. And so here white has managed to save a tempo of the queen. But black's argument is also, well, I haven't played knight f6 either. So it means in turn you don't have any, you're not actually hitting anything when you play g5, right? Uh, so I play move queen d2, just getting out of the way of any b4 and queen c2 mate sort of thing. Uh, black goes bishop b4, again trying to extract some value out of the move order. Bishop to d4, and I think that Grand Elias actually may have outprepared Carlson a little bit at this point, because after g5, white has a very decent initiative. I mean, you're opening up the g file for the attack. Where is the black king going to go in this position? I mean, you can't take fg5 because bishop takes g7, right? So Carlson plays h6 to force a trade. You know, if gf6, it helps the, the black knight get active and, you know, castles and this pawn might come under some pressure on f3 in some lines. So, Carl, so Grand Elias takes gh6, knight h6, and plays a very direct move a3, leading to a great sharpening of the pace, actually. Because let's say you play some quiet move for black, like, I don't know, bishop to f8, for instance, to try to defend the pawn from attack. Well, a, that's a very passive move, and b, even if white just plays some improving, like, like king b1 and just, like, h4, just slowly, you know, make progress on the queen side, or on the king side, rather. I mean, it's not obvious how black is really coordinating the pieces. Yeah, you can go knight f7, but it's like, so what? Your king is still in the center, and your rooks are still disconnected, and... White's position at the end of the day is just a lot more harmonious thanks to space advantage and, and so forth, and safer king. Realizing this, Carlson decides to complicate the play with this little tactical melee of bishop takes a3. No, it's not a blood piece blunder. The idea is to go e5 and to win the piece back by hitting the bishop that's defending the knight. 
Grandelius in turn plays knight b5, and again showing very good preparation. And it would not surprise me at all if this was all prepared by Grandelius beforehand, because we have been following the engine's first line for nearly every move. But here is where Carlson maybe either mixed up some ideas or just got a little bit too optimistic. Probably the best way to play is to go knight to f7, you know, improve the worst place piece is generally a good plan, yes or yes. And if white players move like h4, try and stop any knight g5 counterplay or g5 fixing these pawns as a weakness. Well, black can then play d5, and I think it's a much better version compared to the game. Guess the difference is if white now takes everything like king bishop b5, king f8. Well, I mean, you've got moves like knight d6 at some stage, right? This is kind of a, a significant difference as well. Uh, and if white does go ed5, yeah, you go bishop d5 and... You know, they can't take, obviously, because of mate, but otherwise, you know, white's pawns are all very scattered here. White's king is also exposed, and that gives black, let's say, reasonable compensation in this case. Maybe white's still a tad better, but black should be able to hold. Uh, but the game went d5 instead, and it turns out this makes a very big difference, actually. Because after bishop f5 and king to f8, well, the difference here is that white is not forced to play, like, bishop a4, ed5, like we've seen before. Uh, in the game, Grandelius did play bishop to a4, but here, white has this extra option of playing queen to b4. And in the position where you had knight f7, h4, like queen b4 is like, so what, you're still dealing with this. But here, the difference is you have the move queen b3 in. And I admit, this is not at all easy to see from afar. But the point is that they can't play to d4 or d4 because of the pin. And if knight f7, like, obviously you're not going to play h4 here, but you're just going to take the pawn, the up two pawns, and basically be winning. You know, if they play like knight to uh, d6, it turns out you even have a very beautiful move that it's not necessary to win, but it's kind of cool that you have rook d3 with a point at knight b5, you have like d6 and you're able to discover the check on the on the king as well as the attack on the queen. But otherwise you're in time to go rook c3 to fend off the c-file attack and basically just be up two pawns. So it's difficult, but if you see this, you probably end up beating Magnus Carlsen the way Esipenko crushed Carlsen in 2021 Tata Steel. And as we said, that Carlsen's form in his Tata Steel, Steel not fair, has not been very good at all. It's sort of, I don't know where it's been because he's been feeling the pressure too much of trying to break 2900 or if he's like still recovering from the match in uh, against Star uh, Nepo. But at the same time, we also should keep in mind that Carlsen did have a very slow start in 2018 Tata Steel as well, uh, or 2019 Tata Steel after the match with Caruana. And he just went on winning streaks, won game after game after game, and just completely dominated. So I guess we can't rule out the possibility of this happening in this tournament as well, that he is still just getting warmed up, as it were. Uh, but yeah, it's a good example of the comparison method in terms of the difference between the immediate d5 versus the inclusion of these moves. It's subtle, but it's quite important. But instead, yeah, after bishop a4, now Carlson started to outplay his opponent. Because now after d4, I mean, this structure really is unpleasant for the bishop. It fixes this pawn as a weakness. And so, I mean, black now is the one with the safer king, in fact, and with very good compensation. So knight f7, and yeah, now queen b4 is just a little bit of an empty shot. It's like, okay, I go king g8, and, you know, what was the point of you playing the check? Like, all you've really done is just expose your queen to a b-file attack, right? Um, so white goes rook d2, trying to overprotect this pawn. Uh, black plays bishop a6, very nice move by Carlsen, trying to go bishop c4 maybe in some lines. Um, for example, if queen a4, probably you'd go bishop c4. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of a funny point, actually, that even an endgame is actually very nice for black, because after take, 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 uh, you see here that the pawn on f3 is backward, pawn h2 is isolated, and this bishop is just very, very passive, right? So it's very easy for black to, you know, Go for moves like rook h3 attacking the pawn and knight g5 piling up the attack. Even ideas like knight d6, knight c4 and hitting a3 is also quite annoying. So it's a very nice example of strategic compensation by black here. But white goes for the move f4 instead saying, I'm not afraid of rook b8, show me what you got. So this is what the game uh, continued with, queen a4, bishop b5. And after doing a little bit of a repetition just to kind of toy with the opponent a little bit, at this point, Carlson did decide to to make his push, as it were. And he played the move rook to h3. Um, apparently, he could go bishop e2 first, but I think it kind of is similar in both cases. Uh, well, after f takes e5, this was a good move by Grandelius to open up the f-file for an attack. Uh, and, well, white should probably play the move rook to f2. It's a kind of weird position, because my supercomputer at first is saying that black is close to winning after 
rook b3. Uh, very nice move, sacking the exchange to have the attack. But if you go deep enough, it starts to realize that actually the position is just 0, 0, 0 if white finds all the right moves. For example, like if they go bishop b3, just kind of move the queen back and forth and you know, it doesn't really lead anywhere, right? Or if you go knight to g5, then white can sort of get in with the rooks with stuff like, uh, you know, rook g1 even. It's kind of a very computer-like idea where you sort of give up a, a piece, but you sort of end up getting enough play for it somehow uh, with this very crazy idea of rook f6. And I admit this is very difficult to see in an actual game, but it's also quite a a beautiful point, yeah, that rook c6 and... You know, we win back the piece with very beautiful tactic and basically are able to stay in the game as a result. Um, like king h7, you have a very nice move that, again, very difficult to see from afar, but queen b3 allows you to avoid losing that bishop to some, let's say, bishop a1, queen b1, for example. And yeah, it allows white to sort of get a worse ending that he can hold. But I think we can't really fault Grandiolis for not seeing all of this because a, these are quite difficult engine lines and b, he was probably already quite short on time. So he played a move rook g1, which is a more human-looking kind of move. Uh, and here, actually, Carlson did miss a big opportunity. Uh, he played the move bishop e2 in the game, which probably was, let's say, the second best move. But unfortunately, second best doesn't necessarily cut it when you're playing super GMs. Uh, but the move bishop a6 is actually a lot stronger, and you might be wondering what the difference is. The difference is that after bishop takes f7, there's this very nice move here. Um, not king takes f7, because then... White has a very beautiful counterattack, rook dg2, and suddenly white is back in the game. Or at least he's not clearly losing at the very least. But king h8 is a really lovely point. You just leave that bishop hanging and leave that white king in a way almost trapped, actually. Because if you do play queen a4 trying to save, save the queen, then black goes queen f7, and white's actually not in time to take the bishop because of a very nice move, queen a2. And the white king is so exposed that the activity of black's piece and the weakness of white's king is vastly more important than the fact that white is a pawn up here. And this position actually is just winning for black. You know, you're threatening queen a1 to win the rook. If they go queen g6 trying to defend, you go queen a1 anyway. Because rook h2, you get the pawn back and you still have the attack on the king. And yeah, this is, is just lost. Like queen rook g2, rook h7 even, just defending. And, and somehow, you know, the rook is going to come in or... The queen is going to come in, and, and white just can't defend everything at once. Okay, it's a slightly difficult line. I mean, seeing this whole king h8, like, and not playing all macro capture is a very difficult thing to do from a human perspective. But again, it shows the depth and richness of what is possible in chess. And definitely, I think even grandmasters can learn something from seeing you know, how black could have played instead, based on the fact that both the players did miss this very difficult idea in the game. So black went bishop e2, but yeah, now... The difference here is that king h8 is not really working anymore, because after king h8, white just can play, like, queen takes b8, and then rook e2, and white just gets too much material for the queen. So this is why it was important to put the bishop here instead. Um, so after king f7, black is still pressing, but Grandelius, I think, defended pretty well in the end, where we had queen b7, queen b4, you know, realizing that the trade of queens is very much in white's interest to maintain the balance. You know, even if black gets the pawn back, I mean, you know, white is still fine. So queen c7, black keeps the game going a bit. Um, one very interesting idea would be to try a move like rook hb3 and, you know, try to get in with the rooks like this. But I think that the position should still be holding after, let's say, rook g3 and, you know, trying to get in like this. I mean, black can try some checks, but you're not really getting mates because rooks g3 covered queen c3 mate if, if black were to throw in a check. In. And it just ends up sort of petering out to some kind of equality one way or the other, if you leave the engine running long enough. But I guess, you know, it could maybe go g6 and maybe still try to ask a few questions here as black, because white's king is pretty open, I have to say. Uh, the other idea is to just go bishop c4 and just play for more long-term compensation, saying your bishop is better than theirs, which I guess, yeah, is kind of true. But still, rook dg2, and I mean, you, you do have some play here as white to work with. But in the game, we had bishop b5, and yeah, now rook dg2, so to white's credit, he found this very important trick. And after rook h7, you know, to deal with rook g7 attacks, we have queen b3, and yeah, now the queen comes into the game, and, and white is just totally fine. Our uh, game ended queen b6. Um, I'm not going to analyze this final part of the game, because I think both players played it pretty well. You know, rook to c8, they made the time control. Rook 6 g5 was played, you know, king b1 is a little bit safer, Probably rook 6 drive is actually a bit careless because now bishop d3 
as played by Carlson, is actually quite tricky, and you have to be a bit careful not just getting mated somehow. Uh, so White played Rook F5 and just brought the Rook back to stabilize, Rook to F2. Realizing if Black does play Bishop takes E4, then you can kind of go Rook G4 and sort of harass the Bishop and just kind of be a bit annoying like this. Well, position would be about equal in that case if, uh, if we had this played. So Carlson actually finds a better move. He finds a very nice idea of Rook H6 with the point of trying to go Rook C6 and attack the pawn this way. Uh, and White plays Rook D1. Apparently it's better to go Rook G2 just to kind of provoke Rook C7 and you know, try to defend this kind of way. It's not the most pleasant. I mean, Black is still definitely much better because this bishop is bad and Black has got these much better pass pawns and better safer king. But White can go Rook E1, at least, you know, tie the Rook to the defense and make sure that, you know, at least Black is not just running away completely like White still has drawing chances here with uh, Rook F2 and just sitting on the position, let's say. Uh, but instead, Rook D1 was played with, I guess, a similar idea. But here, actually, Black did miss a little bit of an opportunity, which you might want to try to find for yourself. So in this position, what Black could have done is, instead of move Bishop E4 that was played in the game, which is kind of similar to Rook F G2 note we saw, saw before, but perhaps a worse version for Black. Instead, Carlson had this very difficult idea of playing Bishop to B5. So what's the idea of Bishop B5? Basically, it's to go Bishop A4 and just pile a lot of pressure on the C2 pawn. So for example, if White plays a move such as King B1 to try to anticipate this, for instance, um, say to, you know, meet Bishop A4 with Rook G1 or something like this and try to defend this, this way. Well, Black would even play a move like Rook F6 even. It's kind of an interesting point that you, even a pawn down, that this transformation of structure would be very much in Black's favor. Because then Black's pawns are all in one pawn island, yeah? Whereas somehow it's very easy for Black to kind of attack this E pawn, which of course the White Bishop can't defend, true or true. Even the pawn h2 is also not so easy to defend, and somehow, if black has these three connected pawns in one island versus white split pawns, black can kind of pick them off or, you know, shoot them down like ducks, uh, in a way. Well, at least for those who are in the US who, you know, enjoy some big game hunting, this sort of thing. Here in Australia, we're a bit more conservative, but I think you get the idea. But yeah, I mean, if white doesn't take and he plays rook fd2, well, in that case, I mean, still bishop a4, and I mean, you can see that... White is really tied up to these weaknesses. Like, if you go Rook G1 trying to counterattack, they can go for moves like Rook B6. And and what you notice is that White just has too many weaknesses. Weak King, weak E4 pawn, weak C2. And White's just not in a good position to cover them all at once, simply. Like, if you move the King to C1, I mean... Actually, it's a good question if they do play King C1. Uh, yeah, you can just go Rook CB8, and yeah, you've just got mate in that case. So it's pretty bad for White. So yeah, okay, if Black finds Bishop E5, I think there's a very good chance that Carlsen would actually win this game. But somehow, yeah, these positions that Carlsen normally is able to squeeze blood out of a stone, somehow I guess he just wasn't feeling it today. Because he went Bishop E4, like, grabbing the pawn at the first opportunity, but now Rook E4 follows, and suddenly, you know, the Rook is a bit passive and the Bishop is kind of stuck. And that gives White the time to go D4 and kind of get out of the straitjacket in a sense. Because um, if black plays move like d3, then you can play bishop e5, and the trade of pawns in principle makes it easier to hold the draw, yes or yes. Uh, so black goes rook c5, trying to defend the pawn, stop this, and free the bishop. But bishop a3 kind of disrupts that plan a bit, right? Because, well, if you play a move like rook a5, for example, trying to defend the pawn, white is very, very tricky here. Uh, maybe you can see if you can try to find this move for white. Yeah, well done if you spot the move bishop e7. You know, rook g1, h3 would leave the bishop out of squares. And, okay, computers that after g5, you're at least not dead, but it's not really the move you want to play, right? Um, So, black went rook c8 in the game, and yeah, white played this bishop e7 trick that I mentioned, which is maybe what Carlson had overlooked earlier uh, when playing this whole bishop e4, rook h4 thing. So h3, rook g2, and yeah, I mean, you force a trade of the pieces, but all the pawns are getting hoovered off, and it just becomes what I like to call an ironclad draw, like rook a8, c d3, and, and yeah, there's just equal material, rooks get traded, and yeah, draw is, is inevitable at this point. So yeah, this was a game I think would be a bit disappointing, maybe for both sides, but I think especially for Magnus, because Carlson was definitely winning at some point in this obstacle bishop ending, or at the very least he was clearly, clearly better, but he just, yeah, kind of took that pawn too quickly on e4 and allowed white to escape.
So even though it was a draw, I think this was actually one of the more interesting games of the round, which is why I decided to spend maybe more time than usual actually going through it. Um, there was also a long game between Esipenko and Caruana, where Esipenko played one of my favorite systems as a kid of G4, Arder and a Shablov, Shirov attack, but Caruana neutralized it pretty well, and, you know, it looked like it was a kind of interesting game, like a bit of a full bloody fight, but it did ultimately end in a draw. I'm not going to analyze it, because if I analyze some of these games, it's just not going to be time to cover any of the Challengers games, and I do want to get to some of those at least. Uh, but this next game between Jordan and Van Faris against Mamadrav looks kind of interesting. I mean, it's not every day that someone wins with a black piece at 2700 plus level, but that's exactly what Shark Mamadrav did in this game. And he used one of his old favorites of the open variation of the Royal Lopez. You know, most top players, I like to go for Bishop E7 and some kind of Marshal uh, in Carlson style. Or they like to play Berlin, so without the move A6 thrown in. But Mamadrav often goes his own way. He has a bit more of a dynamic, you know, Aziri sharp style inspired by, you know, Kasparov and so forth. And so Bishop B3, D5, you know, you get active peace play, Bishop E6. You know, often your Bishop will come to C5 or E7. In some lines, say Knight D7, you might end up playing Knight C5 instead and playing to, you know, push in the center or eliminate the Bishop. There are different ways, of course, in which you can play it to get a, a solid game as black, but it's more solidity based on activity, right? Um, but Van Faris plays a very unusual move, like not Knight D2 or C3 or even the sidelines like Bishop B3 or Queen E2. But he plays A4, maybe in the hope of surprising Mamadrav, but it looks like he was relatively well prepared, because he played the move B4. Uh, I think White's not in time to go A5 here and Bishop A4, because Knight C5 is going to cover it, yes or yes. So Van Faris goes back to the Bishop E3 idea, Bishop E7. Now he plays the move A5, a very sensible move, trying to go Bishop A4, but Castles gets out of it. And I'm pretty sure that both players probably had prepared this at home, like Queen D3. Knight c5, like, these are all good moves by both sides, you know, black is anticipating some knight d2 attacks, and in turn white is trading off his uh, dark squared prelate so that he can keep the pressure on d5. Um, and you could play c3 or knight bd2, white decided to go c3 first in the game. Um, and that leads to a very interesting and sort of double-edged position, right? Because black has the bishop pair and a bit of space, but white, you know, is saying that black's structure is a little bit disjointed on the queen side here. And so Black does need to find some sort of activity to kind of make it work. And the movie played 97, I think, is very reasonable. You, know, you could also play G6, which is the computer suggestion going some Queen E7 or Bishop F5 ideas, but uh, perhaps with Rook FD8 and things in mind. But the move in the game is also perfectly fine. You know, one good thing about 97 is also in some lines you might be able to prepare C5 and get those pawns kind of united as such. So Shark plays BC3. Maybe I would go bishop f5 first and then take, but I don't think it makes a big difference. You know, we had take, take. And uh, yeah, I mean, black goes bishop a7. Again, not the absolute first choice of the engine, who likes to go bishop f5 or queen c8, but it's also playable. Uh, knight d4 was played, bishop to d7. Oh, white goes for knight 2 to f3. Uh, well, actually, there is a kind of a choice here, because I think that it would make some sense to play bishop c2 and provoke g6, which is a little bit weakening. Um, I suppose maybe knight g6 is a candidate as well, but I like g6 better to kill the bishop and queen battery. But it's an interesting question of how you actually follow up. I mean, I guess you can go queen e3 and you try to get some attack going like this. But black can also play, for example, c5 and knight f5. And I mean, it's a position where black definitely has his chances. But maybe white can claim some very small advantage just playing like rook fe1, maybe going for c4 at some point, uh, which might be the reason why computer wants to go c4 himself to open up the bishop. But okay, you are giving d4 to white's knight, so it's not like you're fully equalizing as black, but I guess you get some reasonable kind of play uh, to work with. I mean, it's playable at the very least. Uh, but that was probably yeah, the way in which white should play to fight for an advantage, and it might be the reason why some of black's last moves were not absolutely the most precise. But after Van Foree's knight to f3, I kind of feel like black is doing all right. At least in the game, it sort of felt like white was, you know, maybe not playing it in the best way. Like, probably should just go bishop c2 here just to get out of the way of that c4 fork. Van Foree's 40 could do it with e6 instead, uh, which is a little bit of a tricky move, actually, because if black were to take that pawn, say, f6, white would then have the move knight g5, and, you know, you're hitting this, and you also got, you know, g6, knight d6, so... 
E6 is very tricky, but the problem with E6 is that black is not forced to take, right? So what can he do instead? Well, he could play C4 and kick the queen and bishop, for example, which is what the computer wants to do. And there's also the move bishop e8 that Shark played, where you just kind of leave the pawn just hanging in a sense. I mean, I guess white could go bishop c2 once again, and, you know, it's a weird structure where, in a certain sense, both sides kind of have pawns they probably wish were a bit further back. I guess it's sort of dynamic equilibrium is probably a fair assessment, at least after the very funny idea of bishop b8, which, it looks weird, but it does give the bishop a nice diagonal and defend the pawn. So there are positives to the weird bishop retreat. But it said Van Fries, I think, kind of, you know, it's almost like he kind of, jumped off the cliff but didn't have the parachute ready uh, and it's true i do this all the time as an entrepreneur but in chess maybe it doesn't work quite as well uh, and after f5 yeah like probably have to go queen h3 first but in the game we had knight f7 and unfortunately for van Fries, he was kind of sort of clutching at straws like he sort of you know went a bit too far with trying to be creative and as a result after rook f7 and i'm guessing that rook f7 is a movie probably overlooked when uh going into this but the point is that after knight f5 the black has a very important fork pawn to c4. And this allows black to win two minor pieces for a rook. Such that after bishop takes c4, knight takes f5. That if white goes queen f5, I mean this is just clearly better for black, right? Because the two bishops just are raking the board and are way better than the rook and the pawn here. If rook ad1, you can even play like rook queen at e8. And you know, if they play rook e1, you can play like queen f8 even. It might look a bit weird to provoke rook e1 with a tempo, but the idea is in some lines you're going to be hitting that pawn on f2 and sort of getting the tempo back. You know, deep engine lines, you could say. Um, but again, when bishop takes a6 instead, and unfortunately after knight d6, white is kind of just lost, because, yeah, it might be a knight for a pawn for a, a bishop for a rook and a pawn, which might not seem as bad, but the reality is that knight e4 is coming, and f2 and c3 and a5 are all weaknesses. The game concluded with queen f3 and bishop c5 was played. Uh, it's not the engine's first line. You know, it thinks that knight e4 is a lot more to the point to go knight d2 or knight c3 in some lines. But bishop c5 still gives black a big advantage even so. You know, rook a5. And I mean, black does have, you know, a bishop and knight for rook and pawn. But it's also true that when white's able to trade off black's remaining rook, it does give a bit more power to the remaining white rook in principle, yeah? It's sort of a well-known principle when you've got the rook against two minor pieces that your rook becomes more competitive against the two minor piece if you trade the rooks. Though, interesting enough, computer thinks that you should go h4 and kind of wait a move before trading for some reason beyond my comprehension. Um, but in any case, after rook a5 in the game, yeah, he decided to do it this way and then play h4. But somehow it's just not quite as effective. For one thing, probably because just g6 kind of stops a pawn in its tracks, yeah? Uh, but Shark played the move h5 instead, just wanting to blockade and go for this. And I don't think it's quite as good, but it's not horrible by any means either. Uh, you know, after g3, Black did indeed play the move knight e8, which is, again, I think quite a thematic move in such positions. Um, and here, White again, you know, actually found a very nice resource, which is probably the reason why this whole idea of knight e8 is strategically, it's very good, but there's tactically a small flaw with it. Probably it's better to go queen c7 and defend the bishop and then play this idea. And that's probably going to get you a much better version of what happens in the game. Uh, so the difference is 98. It, white does have a little trick in the position to kind of hold. And to Van Fries' credit, he found this. He played the move c4 uh, with the idea that after black takes the pawn, the white has this move bishop h7. And you might be wondering, okay, Max, why wouldn't you just play it right away without the c4, d c4? And the point is that if black goes king h7, you kind of have this fork on these two pawns. And in general, when you've got this material disadvantage as white, it really helps a lot to get the pawns all on one side of the board. Because that makes it much easier to kind of just hold a fortress or, you know, to be annoying with checks on the king or or something like that. Uh, like, you can sort of keep white their king at bay, right? Um, so that would be kind of a fortress draw. And this is why black went king f8 to keep more pieces on the board. But then bishop g6 and the king is a little opened up. Uh, in the game, black played the move of uh, knight to f6 at this point. I think I accidentally paused the video there, but yeah, I just going to say yeah, it is definitely a fun game to look at, to see Mamadrav win in this kind of dynamic fashion, even if he did miss some opportunities to, you know, win the game a bit faster uh, on perhaps let white back in the game at one point. But okay, the next game I want to share, the one other decisive game was one played between Richard Report 
against Pragnananda, and actually this was a game with a very interesting opening. I'm not sure I'm going to go through every single move, because otherwise there wouldn't be time to do justice to the challenges section, but I do want to at least show the kind of cool gambit that Pragnananda played. So after Castle's A3, Black played the main line known as the Kramnik variation, with Pawn to D5. And Black's idea is pretty simple, just to play dc4, b6, bishop a6, get in the c5 break and use Black's lead development to equalize, which is what would happen if White played the normal knight to f3. But at a high level, the more recent trend is to go bishops g5 and try to make the argument that, for example, after take, take b6, that, you know, you can go rook at d1 and, you know, try to hold back this c5 break by putting the rook opposite the queen and delaying knight f3. It doesn't necessarily lead to an advantage per se, but for example, Carlsen has beaten Caruana in its line in Norway chess in the past, so it is a line that has some little bite to it as such. So perhaps this is why the computer therefore recommends playing the move c5 as Prague did in the game, where you sack the pawn, but you get this nice play in the center and a way to use your lean development. And after all, white's extra pawn is double in a sense. So white goes queen g3, black plays knight d7, trying to provoke b4 so you know a5 and you can sort of rip apart the white queen side before white has developed any of his king side pieces so white goes knight f3 getting his pieces out and now e5 again a move that you know you have to be well prepared obviously to play this way as black and sack a pawn but if white does go knight e5 then yeah you're able to kind of go knight c5 knight e4 and you know have some different tricks in the position based on black's big lead in development it's almost like black wants that e pawn out of the way to have the e-file to attack the king, yes or yes. Uh, also, a general point when white plays c4, you don't really want to castle long, because it just is way too weak for your king. So white goes rook d1 instead, just keep up the tension. But rook d1 is actually probably a mistake. Even though report won this game, I think he was struggling a little bit out of the opening. And so what should he do instead is a good question, and I think that a more practical move might be to play e3, you know, try to get rid of his central pawn and, you know, if black takes, maybe you can take with the bishop and control it that way. And then black has a few options. I mean, you can go queen a5 and, you know, play more for compensation, try not to let the white king out so easily. That would be a, a fun way to play it. Computer is saying 0, 0, 0 for all of these lines. Another more spicy approach is to play rook e8 and kind of bait white, if you like, in a castling long and say that, okay, you are winning a pawn with ed4, but also your king is very open in the center. And so after something like, let's say, knight d4, or bishop d3, queen b6, position just ends up being just somehow equal, where, like, black has enough activity against the king and with the pieces to be able to maintain the balance, as it were. So quite fun positions. Definitely could have a lot of fun analyzing them yourself, for sure. Um, there are moves like b4, but I'm not as big a fan of them, personally. But yeah, rook d1 was played, and I think that this is as a problem that you leave the king in the center just a bit too long. And after rook e8, there's suddenly the question of how you're going to defend c5, right? And after b4, a5, you know, suddenly black is quite significantly better, I think. Uh, white went knight d2, trying to, you know, bring the queen to the defense if needed, and also make sure e4 isn't kind of a tempo in some lines. But after takes, takes, I think that this is actually... Uh, a somewhat critical position, and here I think Pragnananda's move maybe lost the thread and was a little bit too prophylactic. I think the move that Black should probably play is just play e4 and just go for the throat, right? Because if White goes e3, for example, then, I mean, after d3, just look at this bishop and the rook. How is these, how are these pieces getting into the game? If you play f3 to try to liberate the bishop, the problem is rook a2 is coming. Actually, even ef3 is not so bad either to open the file, but that is, like, if knight e4, you have this very beautiful move. And I admit, it's not the easiest to see in a practical game, but rook e4 is just very, very beautiful, like, chef's kiss style beautiful. That if they play f4, you've got this, again, amazing move, knight takes c5. And if pawn takes, queen a5 is mate, but if they don't take, well, say, bishop f6, like, you're just killing him, like, queen c3 or knight e4, and very Morphe-esque the way in which black is just playing the attack in such a way. Um, of course, White can play differently, you know, they can play bishop d3 and, you know, just play a piece down where, you know, you've got the bishop pair and three pawns for the, you know, for the two knights and bishop. But objectively, it's not enough, and I mean, Black would be much better. Instead, Pragnananda kind of lost the thread a little bit by playing this move of king to f8, which, okay, he wants to avoid bishop h6, but it's also a bit too prophylactic somehow. Uh, White continued with the move of queen b3, which again is a little bit odd compared to, say, e4 and just trying to stabilize and close the center, which is why I would probably recommend. 
But white goes queen b3 instead, and I think that gives black a second chance to go for an e4 move, which is actually what Pragnananda did in the game at this moment, so credit to him for seeing it on the second try. But after the move e3, this again is maybe a, a rather critical position, because when you've got these sort of moves included, like when, let's say, the queen is on b3 instead of g3, it actually it makes a big difference, because in the game, Prague played the move d3, but what he kind of realized later on is that after h3, that actually, even though white is effectively playing without this bishop, in a weird sort of way, he doesn't actually need the bishop right now, because he's got moves like bishop d6 to go after the king. He can play moves like g4 and bishop g2 to develop from there, or even h4 potentially to open up for his rook. Also, black is just very, very weak on the dark squares, because, you know, bishop d6 is kind of weird tempo here, right? Which is maybe why the computer is saying that you have to go king g8 to not just be substantially worse, just to anticipate bishop d6 check. Uh, in the game, black went knight e5 instead, and then after queen b2, somehow, like, white was just up a pawn for nothing, where white was able to consolidate, and, you know, later on he ended up uh, after bishop f5, he uh, played just the transition to an endgame. Where at this point, yeah, white's, black's supposed space advantage just doesn't really mean that much when there are a lot of pieces still, when there are not many pieces on the board, yes or yes. And, you know, in the end, white just coordinated the pieces, like brought the king up, and yeah, white was just winning. Okay, to be fair, bishop g2 is a bit sloppy compared to, let's say, the idea of bringing the king around this sort of way, but it's still, Report was able to convert his advantage into a win at the end in a long struggle. But I know that you're dying to know, like, what is the way that Black should have played instead at this moment. And if you want, you could actually put it in the comments below, just to... Because I'm curious to see what you think, if you can play better than these players, those top GMs playing as Black. Okay, some would argue over Prague as a top GM, because his range is only 2613, but I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, if he is playing in this sort of league, league of tournament already, that he's going to get there sooner or later. Uh, but the move 95 is the key, and it's sort of a... Quite important point that a lot of players miss. They think that you only have two options, either to play d3 or play d takes e3. But you actually have a third option to actually keep the tension, and by playing knight e5, that's exactly what you do. So that if white does play e takes f d4, for example, well, actually, you can even just play queen takes d4. Um, okay, computer says knight f3 and just, you know, shows off because it's stockfish that, you know, take, take, and white's having to put peace on free to not get mated, but... But okay, more normal players might just take the pawn and, you know, go e3, this sort of thing, and, and win this way. Uh, well, if white doesn't play ed4, though, it's like, what do you do? If you play bishop e2, then d3 comes with a tempo, so the extra two tempi make a gigantic difference, yes or yes. But if you're playing a move like h3, for example, which is a suggestion of the engine, it's kind of like, well, if that's the best you have, like, what are you kind of doing, in a sense? You know, black can play bishop f5. He can keep improving the position, you know, wait for the right moment to go d3, so after bishop e2. Or if white does play bishop e2, find the right moment to play d3 and open up the position. And I mean, it's one of these positions where white just really struggles to find a good move, and that's why black is massively better, because white doesn't have a way to develop the pieces. I mean, g4 maybe, but yeah, then your king is just so weak. Like, even just a move like bishop d7 is a... Very cool idea of the computer. We're saying if ed4, you can go knight f3 once again. Or otherwise, you know, you've got bishop a4, just keeping up that very strong initiative as black. To the point where probably white is just busted on a kind of development sort of level. So a very instructive line, this knight e5, and definitely a big takeaway from the game. But like I said, we do need to get to the challenges games. If we wait any longer, the video will just be like two hours long and nobody will complete it. Uh, so for those diehards who are still watching, let's continue on this path. So the remaining games all ended in draws, and yeah, because of this win by report, he joined it. He joined our Vidit and Mamadjarov on a score of three and a half out of five, with a bunch of players including Magnus Carlsen, half point pine on three out of five. So games like Judah Kayakin and Dubov Shanklin, they also ended in draws, and I think they were not the most interesting games somehow, in my opinion. At least I haven't looked at it deeply, but I think you know, draw in general is not as exciting as a win for the most part. And there is this game that was played in the Tata still challenges, it just seemed to have everything, and I really want to share it with you, in fact. Um, there were some other games played in the challenge as well, some rather long, drawn-out wins, but this is the main game I want to show, because it's the most important one for the standings. So this is a game played between Arjun Eregesi, the player who I predicted before the tournament would win the challenge with an absolutely dominating 11 out of 13 score, and after this game, he is definitely on track to achieve that, having won this game to score 4.5 out of 5 
well, Mirazin before this game was half point off lead on 3 out of 4, but now is on 3 out of 5. Um, so the game went knight c3, and here, Black actually played a move that, like, I've seen it before, but I never was really aware that it was kind of a serious move. And that is the move of pawn to e6. And this is traditionally considered to be a bit imprecise, because you're shutting in the bishop, right? So it's not like, for example, you can play, say, a move such as bishop f5 or bishop g4, which are two of the main lines in this position, to get the bishop outside the pawn chain, and only then play e6. Actually, I think the most common move, if you look up all the transitions, is actually a6 with, which is a Trebinenko-style move, and that is not to stop the knight b5, bishop b5, so much as it is to be able to go bishop g4 and, you know, potentially pin the knight if it goes to f3, or if they go knight g2 to kind of eventually bring your bishop to h5 and g6 and kind of trade off their good bishop that way, sort of the strategic plan. You know, to kind of imbalance the position a bit to play for a win, yeah? But instead we have e6, and you know, I thought, well, let's give it a chance. Maybe this move is not as bad as I had, had previously assumed. You know, bishop d6, you can try to trade the bishops and get some play going. Uh, Aragazi decides to go bishop g3 in the London style, just keep the tension between the bishops. Black goes knight to c6. e3, and well, I'm guessing this was Murison's idea that he wanted to play knight f6 here and kind of say that, well... In this case, you're already committed to bishop g3. Like, you don't have the option of playing bishop d6 and f4 anymore, because if you play it in this stonewall style, you just lose a tempo, compared to if you played bishop d6 and move earlier, right? Um, Because that's a point that maybe it's worth explaining, that here, white maybe is not so readily in time to play a move like f4 in this kind of setup, because black can just go knight e7, and then, you know, this is just less effective when the e5 square can be covered later by a pawn, yes or yes. So, after bishop to d3 in the game, here is where black makes some strategic mistakes I find a little bit surprising. To me, a normal approach to the position would just be to play something like castles, just play normally, knight f3, and then play some solid move, you know, even a move like bishop takes and g3, 6. I mean, it's still a way in the pre-computer era would be considered, like, very weird play to go weaken the dark squares. But white's not really in a great position to deal with it, and it's more important to neutralize that bishop. And also, I mean, by playing g6, yeah, you just make sure your king is quite safe. I mean, you can play bishop d7, rook c8, play on the queen side, and in general, I don't feel like black should be more than a little bit worse in such a position. Um, yeah, black is relatively solid. But instead, black kind of mixes up the move order, and he plays bishop g3, and you're know, on Facebook, I did say quite bluntly that I think the move queen d6 was playing the game is the sort of mistake that's a little bit basic for a player of Merzen standard, because he is like, I mean, his rating is 2519, but I do think he is really 2600 strength in spite of the fact that he didn't really know what he was doing from this sort of pawn structure. And yeah, here, Eregazi found a really, really nice move that I want to see if you can find as well. If you follow my Facebook profile, you'll have seen this position before. But if not, I think it'll be a fun little puzzle. So can you find the move that White played in this case? Yeah, I've been recording a lot of videos today, so it's always nice to get a drink of water and, you know, not lose my voice, as it were. But, okay, if your idea was to play a move like f4, I believe if the pawn is on h2 instead of on g3, this is probably the right move. But, as one of my friends, uh, Adrian Miranda, point out, it's very interesting for black to now play to move h5 and, you know, try to hold back g4 and maybe have this square for the knight. Okay, it's not the engine's first choice, but it's really not that silly an idea at all, I think. Okay, maybe it's more precise to start with bishop d7 and then go h5, perhaps. It might be a little bit more flexible. Like, maybe wait for knight f3 and then go for it at a later stage. But, but yeah, the idea is still quite legitimate to try to fix the pawns in that sense. But Eric Gazi's move is a lot better. He just played the move g4 directly. And one thing I was actually curious about when talking about this with my friend Reese is that he said, well, what if e5, like, what is better? To play d takes e5 or to play g5? And both moves are good, but I think that his suggestion of d5 is actually the better one. So that after knight e5 and g5, we're able to attack the knight and... Well, actually, you're almost winning this pawn, I think, because... If, because if they move the knight say, to g4, you might have some... Okay, actually, you don't have knight d5 tactics technically, but you do have, you know, the plan. Like, say, if they go knight fd7, for example, you know, you can go bishop b5 and kind of win the pawn this way. Because you don't give them an easy knight to b6, and, you know, if they go knight g4... Then, yeah, in this case, you can just go bishop e2 even, and, you know, bishop e6, queen a4, and somehow white's initiative is a bit too strong. 
when Black has some very clear weaknesses, and the Knights are, you know, trading on each other's hoofs as well, yeah? So E5, the typical central counter against a flank attack, doesn't work. Actually, computer suggestion is to go G5, but that is such a horribly weakening move to have to play. So I can't really blame Black for not playing it. Uh, he actually went Knight G8 in the game, kind of trying to anticipate G5 and admit the mistake. G5 is actually still a pretty good move anyway to fix this pawn as a weakness, but in the game, White went F4. And still, White obtained a pretty big advantage in the game. Knight E7, Knight to F3. So it's all fairly normal developing moves, even if it's not the first choices of the engine. Bishop to D7, Rook to C1 is pretty standard. Again, A3 is maybe a tad more to the point to try to go Knight B5 and all out Queen B4 check, but this is a very minor point. F6 was played. Uh, White played the move g5 to try to create some weaknesses. After castles long, White played the move knight to b5. Okay, allowing a queen b4 check, but it's not a big deal. Just king f2 is played. Realizing that black does take the pawn, it's actually kind of suicidal because of a little trick where we can go rook c2. Queen has to go to b4. It's the only safe square. a3, luring the queen away so that we can go knight d6. And ultimately just win the exchange with knight f7, yeah. So, uh, or actually it turns out queen b1 first is even better. You know, threaten the mate and then play knight f7. And yeah, that's an even bigger advantage for white. In fact, just completely winning it turns out. So since black can't actually take with pawn b2, we can confirm it was very well calculated by white. After king b8, a3, I mean at this point white is basically just winning. But somehow he lost the threat a little bit later in the game, in fact. Um, I think it could be quite instructive to go for this game in full. I think there are a lot of learning points that even strong players can take away from it. So knight c3, black plays rook df8, and I think that this is a position where, uh, maybe not quite at this point, I mean knight a4 I think is a thematic move to maneuver knight to c5, because I mean that is the typical way, you know, to attack the weaknesses, to attack the king, so all very, very natural so far. Black played a move bishop to c8 at this point, and yeah, at this point I'm not so sure about the move b5 that was played in the game. Because when you play b5, you're giving this a5 and c4, and it's not so easy to break through. Whereas, let's say, if black goes b6 by comparison, then yeah, your weak thicks weaken some squares quite clearly. So I think in this position, if I was playing white, I would probably... I mean, technically, the computer says you can get away with a bishop h7 pawn grab, but it strikes me as a little bit impractical to play this way. I think a more natural move is just to go queen to d2 and just develop the pieces and... You know, sometimes it's good just to leave Black stewing in his own juices, right? You know, let them try to lash out with a move like e5 that is actually just a weakening move in reality. Or let them play some move like b6, you know, and kind of weaken the c-file and give you a easy plan of attacking the weak knight on c6. It's why, like, you don't have to do all the hard work yourself. Sometimes you can let them, you know, beat themselves up a little bit when they're in a bad position, right? You know, sometimes putting yourself in the opponent's shoes, or as uh, Eminem once said, you know, walk a mile in the opponent's shoes can allow you to get the an easier win than if you try to force it all yourself. Yes or yes. So in the game, white plays the move b5. Uh, we have knight a5. And yeah, now white is is drifting a little bit. I mean, king g1 is not really, I think, in moving in the right direction somehow. For example, if black plays h6 and just forces a trade of pawns in some way, I think that black is getting very decent counterplay. With moves like rook g8 and maybe even knight f5 at some stage. And I don't really see white being better when these pawns are becoming a little bit of a target all of a sudden. So this is what, yeah, white has lost a little bit of control somehow. But somehow black's next moves are not the most precise either. We're after knight f5. I mean, this is a fine move here. And okay, he gets a similar structure in a game with h5. Um, Again, probably h6 is a better way to go about it because... Well, white plays gf6, and maybe it's not the top line, but even here you can kind of see that, uh, well, I was going to say the pawn h5 is weaker than on h6, but now that I think about it, that's probably not true. Um, so yeah, gf6 is a little bit of a weird move to, you know, to give black the g file, I think probably just rook c3 and maybe trading the knight. It's kind of a weird position, it's hard to make a lot of progress, but maybe this is the right way to play it, um, you know, to build up a bit more slowly as it were. But anyway, the game went gf6, knight h4, and at this point I think black is just doing fine, to be honest. Take, take. Uh, rook fg8 is a good move, just get counterplay down that g file against the king, and... Well, we can see by contrast that white's queenside play has just completely gone to a dead end. And I think, yeah, a move like rook g7 would be one decent plan. Uh, knight c4 is a very creative move by Merson, actually, realizing that if white does accept the pawn sack, it actually 
Well, actually, it's not a real pawn sack for tactical reasons that if rook c4. Actually, black can play a very nice move. Rook takes g2. And then queen d5 to win back the material. And, well, clearly the white king is way too exposed in a position like this. True or true. So, instead of that, white plays queen f2. Just keeping the position, as it were. But we also see white is losing the fret a little bit. I mean, you should probably go knight e4 and try to, you know, just blockade and keep some sort of control. But... After queen f2, yeah, now it's not so easy. And I think if black even just plays a move like rook g7 and just, you know, goes rook g8, even a move like e5, just rip open the, the position for the bishop and the queen, I think that black is actually much better. So this is a very up and down game. Like, either side could definitely have won this, but somehow, yeah, it went uh, Eregazi's way after some mistakes. Okay, even after b6, black is probably still doing okay, but... In a long struggle, somehow, white was able to outplay his opponent. I'm guessing maybe the time trouble is also a factor. So, queen d5. White plays a move a4 to hold back b5, I'm guessing. But it is true that maybe uh, f5 is what the computer wants to do. Where you sack the pawn but try to weaken their structure. So, black realizes that and stops this with f5. So, now black still has got some pressure. Um, but, yeah, some of the next moves were a little bit weird. I mean, probably just a simple rook c8. Just defending the pawn would keep a very nice advantage. You know, if white does play rook h5, maybe this is what black want to avoid. But actually, after takes, takes. Black has a very important move, queen a5, which... Okay, it's easy to miss this, but you are taking, so you're not worrying about back rank mate anymore. Uh, you've also got ideas you can take this pawn or go queen e1, for example. Like, this is why queen to a7 doesn't work, because you've got queen e f1, or queen e1, and, and you've got mate, which is kind of an important point. Uh, but if white goes queen h7, then yeah, you can take this pawn and they don't have queen e6, which is a, an important little comparison point. Anyway, the game went queen e4. White went rook a3, we had h4, and okay, still position is balanced, but somehow it just slipped through black's fingers a little bit. Uh, like here, yeah, you probably have to play rook h7, which is not the most obvious world move in the world to play, but it's kind of an important one to make sure there's no back rank, no queen b7 made at some point. A little uh, prophylaxis, as it were. Black goes rook g4 instead, and now the difference is queen f3. A very nice move by white. Using the fact that black would like to move the queen, but he has to contend with queen b7 mate ideas as such. Uh, and unfortunately, to move queen d5 is probably just not enough. I mean, okay, the ending here is not great either, because white is a pawn up, and, well, you're not really crashing through on the king side, right? Like, rook h8, rook c2 keeps control pretty nicely. If h3, just g3 again blocks it all up. But still, I mean, after queen d5, this is an even worse version, actually. After take, take, rook c2, like, all of these pawns are very weak. Even the king is quite weak because of the fawn pawn. Like, you have to constantly watch out for back rank mates as black. So that's probably why black played rook c8, but now the ending is just a win. And it's not like, it'll take time, but it's a win eventually. So, uh, computer is saying that g3 is the fastest way, you know, just kind of trade and just get the rook into the position by force. Um, but, okay, the move in the game, rook h1 is also winning. Where white decides to shuffle a little bit, kind of, I guess, gain a little time on the clock, maybe readjust. Um, and it doesn't really spoil anything, admittedly, to do this. But, okay, at this point, white does make his push. And he plays the move a5 in this position. Uh, and the idea of a5, okay, it's not the top line of the engine, but it still does work. The idea is that after ba5, rook a1, again, you're managing to open up this queen side and attack on a different front. So, rook g5, 8 was played. Rook a5... Rook b8, and now white decides to use the principle of two weaknesses. Now that the rook has gone out of the way, he decides to move back and eventually go after this guy. So we have rook b6, king f3, king e7. White plays rook h1, and I think white's technique in general is pretty good in converting this. Where, you know, to move g3 is, I think, a lot more precise, technically speaking. You know, get them to play h3 and weaken the pawn before you go g4 is kind of a better version. But still the similar idea of g4, while it's not quite as clinically good, it's still good enough to win. We have take, take, rook g6 is played. You know, it's a nice little trick here. Like if the pawn's on a3, you'd be able to take and go king g2. So this is kind of the difference that the king is forced to a slightly awkward square on f5. But even so, this should still, I think, be winning if I plays it precisely. And, well, let's see how the game went. Rook e6. Rook h7 is a very important check here to make sure that the king is forced out of the way of the f-pawn, which is white's main trump card. So rook h3 is played, and... Yeah, here the computer is saying that the only way to try to continue to fight is to play rook to e8. But is it enough to save the game? I'm not so sure. For example, white could play a move such as... 
well, king g6 is a very natural move, right? Just to clear the way for the pawn to advance. And, well, I'm curious to analyze to see how this results after f5, f5. You know, black can play to move a4, and we have this sort of race kind of situation. Black goes rook a8, or let's say, and, you know, king g7, a3. And so we have this position, you know, with the rook coming back to h1, but somehow neither side can can quite queen their pawns after a2, f7, and king to uh, e7. And after giving Stockfish the cattle prod, it kind of confirms that this is basically just going to be a draw. That, you know, there is a tricky move of rook c1 and trying to go rook c7 and queen this way, but black found a very nice, has a very nice idea of rook to f8, where you kind of have this funny position where black queens the pawn, but white is, you know, trying to queen his pawn in turn, and and somehow just ends up being a draw, like white can try to make some progress, but at the end of the day, you know, the queen and king are able to stop the pawn, and you know, you can play like rook e6 and queen, but the rising ending is just a draw, so there's not much you can really do about it. Um, just to clarify, you'd have like take, take, king f5, and yeah, black is getting the pawn in time, and so it's uh, actually, I, I stand corrected, then white would get back actually in, just in time, but black can play king f6 and take the opposition, and, and that's why it would uh, would be a draw. So, uh, so yeah, basically, I think after rook e8, I'm not 100% sure, but I think this might be just when reach a draw with correct play for black. Maybe someone here is going to analyze it to depth 50, and Stockfish somehow finds a way to win it. Um, like maybe for example, you can go king to g5 and maybe there's a difference here, but I just don't really see it. You know, I guess after rook g8, king f6, a5, I feel like it probably, it's probably going to transpose in some version anyway, is kind of my feeling, but I guess why it does have some idea like rook h6 is kind of a, well, a sort of interesting attempt, let's say, to, you know, threaten king f7. This might have some potential actually, something like this, and well, it feels like it gives better winning chances in some ways, but black also can, you know, play moves like a4 and rook f3, and I mean, it does feel like, you know, black is probably going to be able to draw this, because the a pawn does seem to be fast enough here, like uh, f6, a3, and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, so probably black could still have saved the draw, and that would mean that g4 is actually, probably actually a mistake that could have cost the win, if we're speaking on a hyper level, compared to the move g3. But Black did not take his chance. Of course, it was not at all easy to find every single right move to hold the draw. But after a5, the difference is that now, after White's move king g5, White is ready to go f5 with a tempo. And that's what happened in the game. a4, f5, and that tempo just makes all the difference. Rook e4, White goes rook h6. Very important move. So that the rook can get behind the passed pawn. And then it turns after rook d7. Because in the other lines, like, normally in a position like this, like, black would be in time, let's say, to, I don't know, to take this pawn. Like, the pawn might have moved forward and more forward, and it would just be a trade. But because black lost some time playing, like, a5 and not, you know, playing, like, rook e8 to kind of keep white tied up, the result is that now white is just winning. Where it's kind of like Lucina, but with these pawns on the board, right? So, king f6, king d7, king f7, making sure to shoulder the king. King d6, f6, this is how the game went, king f8, and now it's just, yeah, simple, get the Lucina on the board, so rook a7, king d8, rook a6, king d7, and yeah, Aragazi came up with a nice move of rook to h6, and okay, there are many winning ideas, but the plan of going to rook to g8, and clearing away for king g7, and queening is pretty straightforward, yeah, and after rook g5, rook h7, there's also no good defense for that matter to rook g7 and king g8, which is even simpler than the winning method I mentioned, and so Black just resigned here. So a very nice game, and I think it was worth it to, you know, rather than covering a lot of games very superficially, to actually dive deep into it and really extract all of the valuable lessons that we could, because I think that's an important part of going from a 2000 level to a 2200 plus level to upgrade the depth of your analysis, so it's not just like, oh, computer says this is better, let's move on, but to really understand what we need to see and appreciate to find those better moves, true or true. And yeah, if you really enjoyed this video, yeah, do make sure to reach out to me via a DM on uh, Messenger. You know, I put the link in the description as well, so that you can easily connect with me, especially if you're rated like 1900 plus or 2000 plus. Well, I'd love to help you get to that chess master level a lot more quickly, so that you're spending 20% of your time getting 80% of the results, instead of 80% of the time getting 20% of the results, which is what most people are doing. And that sucks, it's very frustrating, and in that case, you normally will give up on chess or your improvement if your progress is too slow. 
do it the fast way and you're not just going to improve a lot faster, but you're just going to stick with it a lot longer because it's much more fun to win and to improve fast than it is to just take forever and feel like you're, you know, treading water and just not getting anywhere, like running your wheels, right? So if you're sick of running your wheels and you're ready to do the 20% of chess things to get 8% results, shoot me a DM on Messenger with the link below. It's in the description and should also be a pinned comment as well. And on that note, I will see you guys in the next video. Take care, everyone.